Hello, everybody. We are now two chapters away from being done. So if you've been counting the, the minutes and hoping that you would get to the light at the end of the tunnel, this is we're getting closer and closer. So we already covered in chapter 10, the Baroque period, or also known as, or AKA the Catholic Reformation, which really wasn't a Reformation. We should always put that in quotes because it's, they, they claimed it was a counter Reformation, but they didn't re really reform anything. The only thing they did is try to make Catholicism more passionate and send out missionaries and um, essentially say all of the changes that had happened during the Protestant Reformation were heretical and would lead to, of course, any followers going to hell, which, you know, it's an interesting thing. And I know, you know, some some students are very religious, some students are not very religious, some students are not at all religious, but the truth is, is throughout most of our human society, faith, religion, belief, even, you know, mythology, you know, folklore, those types of things have had a profound effect on people. So one reason we cover it so much in this class is because of that. So much of it has an influence on society. And it did. Now, this, though, is the chapter. If you, you've been waiting for one that doesn't have a whole lot of religion in it, this is the one. Because in the Age of Enlightenment, also called the Age of, of Reason, emotion, religiousness, um, all that kind of feely feely stuff it goes out the window if anything the enlightenment is a reaction against or a reaction you know in opposition to the previous age where everything was overblown and over the top and super emotional and meant to stir you know it, it's almost like the, the previous age was kind of that shock stuff on on social media where you know it's meant to the headlines and the pictures are all meant to get you riled up well, the Age of Enlightenment says, no, 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 no. All this riled up stuff, no, is not good for us. It doesn't make us logical. It makes us, you know, kind of messed up. And instead we make bad choices. We do stupid things. So what we need to do is forget emotion, forget about all that fervency and back away from it. And instead use our logic, use our reason, our brains to figure out how to solve the world's problems. To, we need to delve into science, mathematics. We need to, to de deal with what we can truly test, not faith. And so this is kind of the, the reaction to that, in both the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Reformation. And it, it's an attempt to, you know, in some ways, put religion in its spot. It, it has a place and it doesn't, you know, in some so many ways, some of the things that, for instance, are part of our government system today, the whole idea of separation of church and state, for instance, the, the the fact that we have Congress, but we also have two other branches of government, you know, and they all kind of check and balance each other. That's from this era, because this is the era in which the United States formed. The American Revolution happens in, in this era, as does the formation of the United States with no king at its head. And so it's it's one of the first you know, it, it really was built upon much of many of the thoughts and reasoning and, and philosophy of this age. Now, of course, the Age of Enlightenment was also basing much of what it discussed on a lot of those pre-Christian texts like Plato, Aristotle, but also a lot of the Roman texts. And so it was looking through the world through that more logical sense, not, not really bothered with what makes people happy or unhappy or what makes people angry or not angry, but what makes people, what logically makes sense to solve what's wrong. So it's, it's one thing to weep about something, but crying doesn't help. Instead, we need to find reasons or ways to change what's there. Now, a lot of the reason that this happened, though, is because, first of all, there was, there's always a counterbalancing reaction. When something big blows up, then there's, a, there's always kind of this mirror reaction to it that, that goes in the opposite direction. Um, and, and we can see that actually, we, you know, we have very extreme sides in, you know, politically in our country, and we have very extreme sides religiously in our country. We have extremes on a lot of different issues, but 
the majority of us are kind of in the middle, but we get swayed one way or the other. And that's kind of what happens in this age. Does everyone espouse reason in, in the age of reason? No. But the, the people who wrote at this time and spoke and painted and sang and, you know, created music, these, all these people were kind of caught up in this movement towards logic. Certainly the scientists were. And we're going to go over quite a few scientists, but we're also going to go through a lot of philosophers this time, because they were the ones who sort of, in some ways, even we, th their, their words were even quoted when the formation of the United States happened. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot of, there are a lot of threads that you will see that kind of bleed into what we are today. And I just want you to kind of see where it all came from. So reason was absolutely paramount. That's why it, it was called the Enlightenment. And yet that meant you, what you, to be enlightened meant that you had knowledge that gave you insight and a viewpoint of the world that was expanded. So a, an unenlightened person was an ignorant person, an unschooled person, someone who couldn't see beyond their own lives because they didn't have the experience or the understanding, and they, but they could be taught. And this is the key. So everything, really the number one key to everything very quickly became education. If, you know, they looked at poverty, well, why are all these people poor? Well, they, they don't have skills. Why don't they have skills? Because they never went to school. Well, we need to develop schools so that we can help these people get an education. What are we doing today, right now? If you're watching this video, you are in the process of taking a class. There are many people, you know, any of you who are female, for instance, would never have been taking this class at this age. So in the enlightenment, women were pretty much excluded still from real education with a few exceptions. Um, I think it would be another century from the beginning of the age of reason before women were allowed to go to attend an actual like co-educational college. The vast majority of schools were either for women or for men. And the women's, the women's schools were usually finishing schools. So they taught you embroidery. They taught you how to dress, how to stand up straight, how to set a table so that the forks and spoons and knives were all in the right place, how to fold napkins. I mean, literally how to run, you know, order servants around. And that's only if you were upper class. If you were lower class, you pretty much had no education. And it's very likely you wouldn't even know how to read and write. So what was the way of solving all of this? Education. How could it, you know, how could we manage realistically the people who are on the streets who don't, who are homeless or the people who are in such abject poverty that they can't eat, they don't have food. How do we stop crime? Well, there was a logical reason why crime exists and it still is true today. If you actually take criminal justice classes, the main reason crime exists is because people can't get what they need through legal means so they use illegal means and so if you make it so that people actually get what they need have a place to live feel safe can you know have food to eat and feed their children you're much less likely to have people committing crime so but again it's all this logic it's logic 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 if we just logically go through each of these things we can figure out the solution and much of this comes from an idea of you know, from scientific theory. And we're gonna talk a lot about scientific theory and methodology. If you've ever done a science experiment, you know, where you had to do that kind of presentation and make a volcano that spewed lava or something like that, um, you'll understand kind of where this comes from because you probably learned scientific method. Well, this is really where it started. This is where it was developed and written about and, and tabulated. So if you developed a hypothesis and then tested the hypothesis and created the experiment, all those things, then you have used scientific theory. Uh, but this is the time too with, with the advances in technology, people had more access. They could, they could see this, the sky more clearly. They could you know, measure stars more clearly, see more planets. They could study things that they had not been able to really study before. Plus the Catholic church didn't hold as much sway because it had lost so much of its power. And so it couldn't necessarily execute everybody who was coming up with theories, scientific theories that it didn't agree with the, the Catholic church. So a lot of that would be changing, although not all of it. Probably the most notable man, and he, and he is in the, the chapter, but um, probably the most notable scientist to face the, the Catholic church during this age and lose 
was Galileo Galilei. He did not invent the telescope, but he definitely used the technology and refined it so that he could really look out into space with much more clarity than before. He also tested gravity. He did a lot of other scientific experiments. But his findings, when he, he essentially what he discovered was something that the Greeks had discovered 2,000 years prior, and that's that the Earth was not the center of the solar system. The Catholic Church had insisted that the Earth was and had actually executed many scientists over the centuries who claimed that it wasn't. But mathematically, if you measure the movement of the stars, the movement of the planets, things like that, Galileo said that there's absolutely no way that the Earth is the center of the solar system. Instead, it is the third planet in the solar system and the sun is the center. Well, he wrote that, Catholic Church brought him up on charges and he would probably at least have been imprisoned if not executed, but he recanted. He said, no, none of, none of the stuff I wrote was true and he wrote nothing else. And for the next 11 years, he spent his life in, under house arrest in his own home and then died. But he was Italian and the Catholic Church still had, held very heavy sway in Italy. It did not hold sway everywhere else. And so a lot of the, the scientists and, and philosophers and, and um, medical doctors and you know a lot of the technology that was changing was outside of Italy and in places that were not Catholic territory. So we'll talk a lot about essentially the, the areas of learning and the, the discussions that were happening, these enlightened, you know, meetings with the philosophes, for instance, in the, in France. And these people were trying to figure out how do we solve what's really, you know, how do we see what's true? First of all, how do we really test what's true through science? And then once we know what's true and what's causing whatever it is, how do we fix it? So they essentially most of these people, even whether they were religious or not, I mean, many of them were still religious, but a lot of them, including a lot of the forefathers, the, the founding fathers of the United States, um, were what we call deists. Now, that's not there's not actually a church for deism, but deism is more of a of a, a facet within a belief. And this facet says that if you know that God created the world, but he was not actively participating in it now. He was essentially allowing us freedom of choice. We think about free will and that's, it goes along with that deism does. And it's our job as human beings living on the earth to take care of the earth, to take care of each other, to make the society as ideal as possible. We can't depend on prayer to God so that he can intervene. It's our job to intervene. We are his agents, we're his actors, if that makes sense. But there are also a lot of people in here who are either atheists outright or agnostics, you know, they're not sure if God exists, or they just feel that science and, and religion have no, should have no relationship with each other. And this mostly stems from the tendency from the, the, the churches, not only Catholics, but also some Protestant sects, to get in the way of technology, science, medicine, math even, you know, to, to put their oar in and say, no, religiously, it has to be this. And then science goes, oh, we're trying to figure out what's right. And so the scientists are often very dismissive of faith. And they say that church has no place. They should have no authority over scientific experiments. And we still have these kind of conversations today. You know, who should determine whether abortion is legal or not? Should it be people who are, have certain ideologies or should it be up to science and medicine? Should we allow genetic modifications or genetic testing? Even the 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 COVID thing, you know, the 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 essentially the inoculation that people got against COVID, you know, using an mRNA strain really freaked out a lot of people. And so, you know, because they say, well, isn't that messing with with our natural biology? You know, and are we playing God? And so, but there's, there, there are whole sects of Christianity and other religions today that do not invite science, that essentially say we, and they don't allow people to go to the doctor. They don't think that medicine, they think medicine is playing God. 
And so, you know, we still are having that kind of conversation, but for the scientists, they said, look, we need to experiment with all this stuff. We need to actually test stuff. And unless we test it and find it to be true and prove it, it's not true. It's a theory. And so that's, that's really the essence of what happened. And Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon is probably the, the forefather of that. He really did outline scientific method in his writings. He wrote a lot of essays. And these essays were all about, look, you know, if you're going to say something's true, you have to prove it before you can say it's true. If you don't, if you don't prove it, it's not true. And you can't just be biased and say, well, I think it's true, therefore it must be, or it's true until I prove it wrong. No, 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 no. You have to actually go through and test it and test it and retest it and trust it some more before you can ever say that it's probably true. And you have to test it in different ways. But your whole goal as a scientist is to be unbiased. Even if you think something will happen, you don't have a right to say, well, so therefore I'm right. You have to test everything. You have to be skeptical of your own theories. Otherwise, you're not a scientist. And he said that he definitely, he was not irreligious, but he felt like religion had no place in science. And mostly because of the past, because the, the religion had gotten in the way of science for a long time certainly in Europe, especially. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, you guys probably know better than Sir Francis Bacon. Both of these are British. Um, and Sir Isaac Newton, of course, you know, if you know the story, then an you know, apple hit him on the head and he went, oh no, there's gravity. So he didn't discover gravity. That's absolutely hilarious. But he did outline through several laws, actually. He, they became laws not necessarily, they were theories, and then they became laws after his lifetime. But these are the laws of essentially movement. Um, well, he says motion. Yeah, and there are laws of motion, laws of gravity. And he essentially, he figured out, along with several other scientists, that the reason we have gravity on this Earth is because the Earth has mass. And it is actually drawing us to the center. That's why we can walk around without floating off of into, into the air. Although that would be fun. But he says it's, the, it's because of gravity and gravity will automatically affect, but they even looked at, you know, objects, if they're the same shape and size, they'll fall at the same rate. Honestly, even a bigger object, if it's, if it's shaped the same way, will fall at the same rate. Only things that have air resistance, such as a feather, will fall more slowly. And so it's, it, you know, it's, it's funny how that happens, but, you know, he, what he did is outline how gravity works is what he did. Same with motion. My favorite motion one is the, the law of inertia. And that's it. A body at rest will tend to stay at rest and a body in motion will tend to stay in motion. And that I, I say that my kids are the victims of inertia because they tend to be at rest and they like to stay at rest. They do not like to get up if they're sitting down. So, and that's it, isn't that all of us mostly? But, but he definitely developed and he wrote out and explained a lot of these different physical elements. You know, some of them still be, are basic to physical science, to biology, to even physics. So, and they're, they're certainly ones that we just take for granted. We all know gravity exists, so. Um, but he's he's definitely one of the seminal ones. The other people who I mean, they don't I don't have them all listed. Just but there are some in your in your chapter as well. You know we have Kepler, who you know not only did he say that the the solar system you know that the sun was at the center of the solar system, but he even said that the solar system was elliptical. It was not, you know, like all the planets didn't circle the sun in a circular motion. They are farther and closer at different points in their orbit, which is absolutely true. In fact, the Pluto, which isn't, you know, is only like a, a dwarf planet now. It was a non-planet, I don't know, for several years that it was a planet before that. But they, the scientists just can't, they can't decide. They keep, I don't know, changing the parameters of what that is. But Pluto has a, an extreme elliptical um, orbit so sometimes it's extremely far away and and it's always kind of far away but then it gets farther and farther and farther on certain parts of its path so but he also said that sound works differently depending on whether something's coming towards you or going away from you 
And it's one of my earliest memories, actually, when I went to a science museum in Oklahoma City as a kid, and they had a Kepler experiment going on constantly. And it was this bar with this buzzing sound, and it would come, it would swing in a big arc. And so it would swing towards you at some parts of the room and then swing away. And you could hear it sounded different coming towards you. And when it went away, it sounded different than it had towards you. And it said because of waves of, of sound travel differently. And so that's the reason why, for instance, a car coming towards you sounds different than it when it drives away. And we get used to that different sound. So we, when we hear an engine, we can actually hear if the, if the car is driving away or, car, or if it's coming towards us. We get to notice, we understand the difference. We just don't really think about it. So what a lot of these scientists were doing is really trying to figure out what exactly is at work here? Why are things the way they are? And how can we explain it to people like me? You know, ordinary people who aren't scientists. But whatever it was, everything was about testing. You can't just say, hey, this is true, and I believe it's true. No, you have to be able to test it. So science was all about the testing. And if you can't prove it, if you can't, if your experiment can't be replicated to get the same results, it's not valid. And that's still the basis today. We have doctors, for instance, who will claim some drug helps people lose 50 pounds in, you know, eight weeks or whatever. And then they, they did all this testing and, you know, 80% of their population lost 50 pounds. Well, other, take, other scientists and, and, and doctors will take that experiment, try to replicate it, and five people lose like 20 pounds. And the rest of them, you know, it's, it's like not even close to the same results. And so that, that usually makes means that the person was lying. They were faking evidence. So it's very important even today for scientists to very clearly explain how they do their experiment so that others can replicate the experiment and see if they come up with the same results to test the theory. It is not a law, you know, that law of mechanics, motion, and gravity. It's not a law unless it's proven and proven and proven and yet someday down the line it may still be proven like for instance we have that theory of and it's one that charles darwin came up with at the end of this era the theory of evolution but it's a theory it's still a theory it's not the law of evolution because there's no way to prove it and there's still even among the scientists in the scientific community there's still a tremendous debate on exactly what it is that happened or has happened or is happening in you know evolutionary wise and but the the main thing is the most of the scientists say well it, the, there's no way that the earth was was created in 6 days 6000 years ago and that's so it's you know we can't take the religion literally and make it science and so that's where the the big rift happens between science and 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 faith so now we have a lot of other people at the same time that we're doing all the science and the scientific discovery and using new technology. We have a lot of other great thinkers who are thinking more about social changes and social um, analysis. So they're trying to analyze not the way that objects move because of gravity, but the way why people do what they do and how do we stop the bad stuff from happening, essentially. And so some of them do it through fiction. Um, Voltaire was actually, he was a, a very, he was an essayist as well. He wrote a lot of essays trying to essentially argue for social reform. He absolutely believed in and wrote about free speech and the need for people to be able to speak and write freely without government or religious intervention. So we should be able to quit, criticize the king. We should be able to criticize the church. We should be able to criticize other leaders. And we should, that should just be allowable. We should be able to speak our truth, even if it is not popular. And we certainly freedom of speech is the first of the Bill of Rights. It, well, one of many lists of freedoms in that first Bill of Rights in the United States of the, our constitution. But he absolutely believed in religion. He didn't believe in religion. He believed in religious tolerance. So you believe your way, I believe my way, somebody else believes their way, and we all allow each other to do that, that no one's belief system should allow them to lord it over someone else, that we're not allowed to impose our beliefs on other people. So in other words, 
it's freedom of religion. You can believe whatever you want to believe and go and practice your own faith any way you want to. And everybody else needs to leave you alone. And no one should be told or forced to, you know, follow a religion they don't believe in. He also, but he, of course, he argued against monarchies, abuse of power and believe, but, you know, honestly, his best thing was Candide. And this, this, it's a, it's a really fun story, but it's all kind of tongue in cheek. So it's, it's a lot of satire and Candide is a young man who has a, a teacher and his teacher always says, you know, that we live in the best of all possible worlds and things turn out in the best of all possible ways. And everything is the best it could possibly be He's like Mr. Pollyanna, you know, and horrible things happen to Candide, to Candide's, um, fiance to the teacher they almost get hanged because they're the a, a, at one point a, vo a volcano erupts and so candide and his professor are both captured along with a bunch of jews and heretics and they're all going to be hanged to appease god so he stops making the the volcano go well the truth is is this is based on real events people really did this you know in, in the alps if there was some some you know, earthquake or some volcano was doing something, people would literally drag a bunch, bunch of, you know, non-religious people in and, and execute them to appease God. And so Candide really makes fun of that as almost, you know, really it's superstition. God's not making it happen. Um, and yet they're, they think that all he needs is a few heretics killed. It's rather like there's actually a church and it's in Kansas that became notable early in the in the 21st century for picketing soldiers funerals and they would say that you know like the signs were horribly offensive like god laughs at your pain and 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 essentially they said that god would keep killing soldiers american soldiers as long as we allowed uh gay people to live i mean literally it was that offensive and it, it finally disbanded after the, the father. Um, it, most of them were relatives uh, under the father who kind of headed as the, the minister of the church, the quote unquote church. But again, it's this belief that that God is, you know, even the idea that a hurricane hits New Orleans. And so New Orleans deserved it because they were Sin City or something. And actually, I mean, you could talk about Las Vegas too, but the assumption that bad things only happen to bad people or people who've done bad things, that's what comes out of this, but it's all superstitious and it's, it's incorrect. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people actually. So that's not why things happen. You know, why disasters happen is not to punish people who are, you know, bad, but essentially it's, he laughs at all of that, it, but it threw, a, I mean, it's honestly a very entertaining story and it's not super long. Um, so I, I strongly recommend that. That's just a fun, it's a funny story, but it also says a lot of, makes a lot of really good points about how silly humans can be um, or weird or even toxic humans can be. Um, on a nonfiction side, though, we have Charles de Segundat, but he's better, better known as Montesquieu, Baron de Montesquieu. And Montesquieu, uh, probably more than any other philosopher, affected the United States. Um, certainly we took some of the ideas from Voltaire, the idea of free speech, free re freedom of religion, you know, that kind of stuff. But he said, he believed that everyone should be equal and they weren't because of class. And we, they were born unequal. And the only way to make them equal was education. We needed to educate everyone. And so public education, which did not exist at this point, so that they could, you know, really have an equal chance at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No, no, that's going to come up um, with another uh, philosopher, actually. But he absolutely argued against slavery. So slavery had already been started and was going full force at this point. Mostly now, I mean, by this point, the vast majority of Native Americans had died. So they could no longer be, remember, a lot of scientists say that it could be as many as 90 percent of the the native american population in north and south america was gone within a hundred years of exploration so but montesquieu was was horrified by the use of slaves and the, the taking of slaves from africa 
and he said no one should be a slave slavery should not be allowed in any part of the of the world and there was no no one should have the right to own someone else and he did not own slaves and nor will he ever own slaves he and it's funny because there are some kings that never own slaves i actually was researching uh, george the third who was one of the, the he was the king over england when the united states had its independence he never owned slaves not never owned a single slave and believed slavery was horrible so you know it's he's not the, there are a lot of people who had the capacity had the wealth where they could have owned slaves and they 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 felt it was um just simply a wrong to own them he also and this is where he probably has the most specific uh, effect on the united states government he believed in the separation of of powers so we needed if you had a government you need to have different parts of the government checking on each other so that no one part of the government became too powerful or abused its power and so we still have that today we have the le the legislative branch which is the con you know the the house of uh, houses of representatives and then the the senate we have the judicial branch for the courts, the Supreme Court, plus all of the other appellate courts. And then we have the executive branch with the president and his cabinet. So we still do have that. We don't have any single entity that has all of the power. They share the power and they check on each other so that they can keep each other from going too far overboard. Um, now, Jean-Jacques Rousseau absolutely had an effect on the Declaration of Independence. He was another French philosophe. Um, he believed that rulers could only govern with the consent of those they govern. So if a people, you know, are being governed by someone and he's bad, if he's a bad ruler, he's selfish and he's not helping out people, his job is to serve them, to make sure that the, the society is as stable and as prosperous as possible and that the people are safe and protected. If he doesn't do that, then it is not just their right but it is their obligation to overthrow him, to get him out. And so a lot of his words were almost word for word used in the Declaration of Independence. Because it says, you know, when a ruler doesn't do what he's supposed to do, we have the right to declare independence from this ruler. And that's what this was. This, the Declaration of Independence was a declaration of war against George the third you know you're not ruling the way you should of course George the third was pretty much mad so um he well he had bouts of madness that eventually he became all-consuming but um but he he wasn't they didn't feel like they were getting a fair shake and so they they had the right to overthrow the ruler and same thing here if we have a president and we don't like the president we have the right to vote him out we have the right in fact, we have the obligation to vote him out and choose somebody else. So if we can. Um, there are other people too, and I didn't want to like leave out men and leave out women because a lot of the salon, it's just like, it's like a parlor or a big, you know, like a big living room or whatever. But a lot of the salons where all of these philosophes would meet every week were tended by women. Women were the hostesses. And so they, and they were very, many of these women were very well educated. They not only knew how to read and write, but they wrote themselves. Um, but they, they're mostly what the women did. They, they, especially in France, this was in France, is first of all, they, they created and, and compiled an encyclopedia. It's the first time that we had this kind of a, of a document, a, well, multi-volume document, kind of like in the encyclopedia today, where you could look up all sorts of things. But they use the writers and philosophers and scientists and all the people that they they invited into their salon and to to write parts of it. And then they compiled it together to create an encyclopedia. So people could read, you know, find definitions for many of the terms, ideas, um, um, even philosophical theories and have access to that as a as a reference. But she was uh, Marie Therese Geoffrin was was one of many hostesses. She was just one of the better known, and a lot of these were up. These were upper class women, still well educated, and they definitely contributed to the conversation. 
So, but they invited the big, the big brains all together so they could hang out and, and share ideas week after week after week. And that definitely had a profound effect on the whole tenor of this. Remember, this is the age of reason. This is the age of education and philosophy. This is the, the time when we start figuring out, well, why does th do things happen the way they do and how can we make them happen better? Um, in Britain, we had several there. These two are really like diametrically. They must have been enemies or something. Um, John Locke was he actually was the one who came up with the idea that that people have the right to life, liberty and property. Of course, we say instead of property, the pursuit of happiness. So, but we changed a little bit, but for the most part, it's the same. Um, he did not believe in the divine right of kings, though. So, you know, remember that thing that that the the Catholic Church had kind of backed up all of the kings at the time and lords and you know people of of rank were born people of rank, and so that God intended them to be in you know authority over the rest of the common people. You were born common, then God intended you to be of lower rank and not have the same advantages. And the truth is, is these were real advantages. We don't understand it. I mean, I guess the closest we can get to it here in the United States is our social class is almost exclusively determined by money and connections. So very wealthy people can get away with things that that poor people can't get away with. You know, they can hire a million lawyers. They can, you know, falsify evidence, hire people to do the dirty work for them, blah, blah, blah. Well, in this in in European society, which had, of course, the nobility, you know, those those higher ranked people with titles, those noble people, it, it, I mean, even if they committed murder, if they committed it against someone who was a lower class, the likelihood of their being put in prison for it was slim to none. It would be very they we they didn't have a public police force anywhere at this point. It's not until re pretty recently actually that we have that. So if you wanted somebody, if somebody had done something wrong to you and you wanted them arrested, you had to pay private cops essentially to go and track the person down and arrest them and put them in jail. Only the government really had the authority to send these people, you know, for, for you know, and, and arrest people. If you had a, a beef with them, you had very little recourse if you didn't have money. And so, um, and if they were ranked, you didn't have a chance and, and you were not. So it was it was really there was a vast difference in how very noble people were treated versus the rest of us. But he said, no, 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 that's not true. He says people are not inherently noble. He says we're all born blank. We can end up evil. We can end up doing horrible things if we're taught to do horrible things or we can end up wonderful by doing great things. And so we're a blank slate. We're we're a tabula rasa. And so education is how we make sure people are are raised to to be to do good things and to be productive and to work hard. But it also is the way that we even out society. Everybody should be educated, even the very poorest people, or even especially the poorest people. People who can't afford an education should have one anyway. And so that was, and that's how we make society better by improving the the situation for everyone. So he was kind of along with Montesquieu. You know, where he was, everybody is, deserves equality. Everybody deserves an education. Everybody, you know, that's how we make it so people aren't in trouble. Thomas Hobbes absolutely believed in the, the rule of kings. He absolutely believed that people born into nobility were intended by God to help quell the masses. And the masses were stupid and greedy and mean and would do any, you know, they were un, unbridled. You know, they were, they were just not going to they were not going to take care of themselves and so we needed a strong government and a very strong king to keep people in line otherwise everyone would be killing each other so if we didn't have all these really strict laws and these really strict rules the common rabble would all you know become i don't know they they kill each other and eat each other or something you know that they're just not they, they would lose their minds and it would all go to pot. And are there people in society who do, you know, seem to thrive on that kind of trauma? Yes. Are the majority of us this kind? No. But it was not a common theory. I mean, Thomas Hobbes was not exactly, his, his ideas were not the typical ones. 
but he absolutely disagreed with John Locke. If anything, Thomas Hobbes too said it's not the, the key is not education. It's putting people in jail when they do things wrong. So it's punishment. It's kind of like a you know good cop bad cop or something. You know, if if you teach a kid why he's not supposed to cross the street with, and not and without looking both ways, then that's smarter than if you just spank the crap out of him if he does that. You know, so so it's it here's John Locke just explaining to the kid this is why you have to look both ways because you could be hit by a car, and this is Thomas Hobbes saying you know just thwack the kid with a ruler. So it's it's a little bit different, but the the essentially Hobbes just felt that common people could not simply couldn't grasp the need to behave how they should in ways that the, the nobility could, and so it was it, we we had to be obedient, I guess. Um, we also had female philosophers, um, not just hostesses. Olympe de Gouges was um, French, of course. But she actually wrote a declaration of the rights of man and of the citizen. And the title is deceptive because it's much more, it is about, you know, what human rights should be, but it absolutely included women. And she said women should be able to vote. Women should be able to get an education, same education that men can get. Women are just as, as suited for roles in education and government as men are. Because even typically here, you know, in a women's school, most of the teachers were women, but most of the subject matter was not academic. In a traditional school, though, you know, if there was any, you know, even in elementary school, if they had anything co-educational co with both men and women in it, girls and boys, um, most of the teachers were still men. Because women couldn't, they didn't have the qualifications to do those types of things. Um, so she she said, why can't women do all of these things? Why can't women get an education too? Now, we're, the truth is, is there were not nearly as many strides made for women's rights in this time as there were for other things. So, but the women at least felt they had the freedom to speak out. Now, Mary Wollstonecraft, you may not have heard of, but her daughter, you probably have. Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, who comes in the next, you're going to see her in the next era in chapter 12. She was the author of Frankenstein. And so I just want you to remember that because when we get to Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, you're going to go, oh, yeah, that's that. You know, the, well, her mom was Miss Freethinker of the world. And she, she was, they were married. She was married to her husband. But he was also pretty outspoken about women's rights, thank goodness, because she sure was. And she wrote many essays and in several books talking about the fact that women were just as smart as men, they had just as much capacity for learning as men, and they needed the, to have the same rights. They needed the right to, to property. They needed the right to own property. Um, they needed the right to vote. They needed the right to an education. Why should they be, you know, kept at home doing dishes and tending little kids when they should be able to go out and get a job and be intellectuals just like men are? And so she definitely advocated for that. and and. Really, you know, people would say, oh, women, they're just not very smart. And she'd say, no, women are perfectly smart, but they don't have access to education. So they can't learn that they're not allowed to learn. They're prevented from learning what men learn in the course of their their childhood and youth. And so she says, then they're they're left ignorant and they have and then people say, see, women are silly. And she says, we have no other course because we, we're not taught to be anything else. So she was she was pretty. Loud mouth, but honestly, her stuff makes a lot of sense. And at this time, too, remember, I mean, and and we, it's different today. You know, I can own a home in my own name today. That could never happen. In fact, when the, in um, in two thousand, no, in nineteen o two, England finally got the women had the right to vote, but they had to get the right to own property first, and that happened in nineteen hundred. So literally, I mean, and that's the thing is too, is you couldn't vote in England at that time unless you own property. That's exactly what happens when we get to the United States. So we, here we have this democracy, actually it's a republic, but the only way you could vote is if you were male, you were white, you were a citizen of the United States, 
and you own property. So all the men, you know, who even the, you know, majority white, all these other men who didn't own land or a house or any other property could not vote. So the only people who could would, so think about just yourself and people you know. Do you own your home? Do you rent? If you're in an apartment, you don't have the right to vote. Imagine how different this country would be if only people who owned their own home and land could vote. So that's kind of the way it was. And that was the way it was for centuries, okay. So in America though, and a lot of these philosophers, you know, in America, there a lot of them are our founding fathers, you know. Um, you probably recognize Ben Franklin from, you know, over here on the very far left. Then we have Thomas Jefferson. Then we have James Madison, father of the constitution. And then we have the last two, one's a woman, but she is not, she was not one of the founding fathers and yet she gave her husband a lot of good ideas. This is Abigail Adams and John Adams. He was, I think the third president. Um, Jefferson, I think was the second president. Anyway, um, but Abigail and John Adams, actually, she tended their farm for years while he served in Washington. And they wrote letters back and forth to each other. And they're really fun letters. She even asked him when they were putting the Constitution together. Um, she said, well, you know, it'd be really great if you give women the right to vote. And he said, you know that women are in charge anyway. But he says, I don't think I can get that done. He told her plainly, I don't think I can get women the right to vote. We do have one state that allowed women to vote. I think it was Wisconsin. I'll have to look it up. But there was one state that when it formed, not it wasn't one of the colonies, so it wasn't early in the United States, but when it did form, its state constitution allowed women to vote. Um, but most of these people, they were deists, like I talked about before, you know, where they felt like it was their job as people on the earth to make the world as good as possible, that God was, had made it, but he wasn't running it. Um, but he, they, they also, a lot of them went overseas. They, they spent time in France. Um, Jefferson definitely did se for several years, more than one visit. And they learned from the philosophes from France. And they definitely used a lot of the ideas of Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu, um, and even Voltaire to form both, you know, most of the, the founding documents for the United States. It's one probably one of the big reasons they didn't have a king that we 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 from the very beginning we we created this the the role of president and made it an elected position. Now we also had the opportunity within the Constitution. We 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 started the first the, the Bill of Rights, the first ten um, amendments, though we started with them, so they weren't really amendments. But then we allowed for the adoption of other amendments to the Constitution. And so that is one reason why we now have, you know, amendments in the twenties. And that's because we've added many more laws. One of them was the law that essentially allowed um, black people to have just as not only emancipation, but um, to have the right to vote. Um, and that they tried to do that early. You know, we actually, you know, John Adams was actually a, an opponent of slavery. Uh, Jefferson was not, even though he, I mean, He's probably deemed one of the nicest guys and everything. He was a slave owner. He lived in Virginia. Um, Wa Wa George Washington was a slave owner. Um, ben Franklin was not. And, and very rapidly, of course, the North, Northern people owned far fewer slaves and then eventually slavery just was not allowed in the Northern states. But, um, but yeah, Jefferson not only had slaves, he, he had several children by one of the slaves. And the, the, that slave and then her children, he freed on his deathbed. But um, it's a, it was a longstanding thing where he had, I mean, and he was married too, yes. There, it's funny because there, that's, that's pretty recent, but it's, if you read his essays, Jefferson does spend a lot of time, um, he actually has many essays written in defense of slavery, explaining why it's better off for the African slaves to be slaves because they can't really fend for themselves than for them to be freed. And it's really, a, it's a pretty appalling, actually. Um, but, you know, one can reason almost anything, I guess, you know, with rationalization. But he was a slave owner, so of course he would believe slavery was fine. As they were all collecting together, 
the war of, of um, essentially the, the French and Indian war happened and Britain helped at, well, first we had, you know, the, the, of course, all the colonies were forming and they were forming kind of, and budding, abutting a lot of tribal lands, a lot of places where Native Americans had typically lived. So they were slowly pushing them more west. And Great Britain created a line saying, you can't cross this line. Native Americans live over there. You guys in the colonies live over here and leave each other alone. But that was to the, a lot of the Americans, that was prime real estate. I mean, Washington even went over and scouted that area. So um, he knew how, and he, he met several of the natives and, and several of the chiefs. But um, the British government, you know, once they had the French and in Indian War, which was actually fought, you know, really in the northern parts of, of the colonies and all the way up into Canada, um, the British said, look, we spent way too much money on this war. You guys are going to pay for it. And so they demanded, they raised taxes all over the place with the Americans, uh, with those colonists, and said, you're just, you got to pay this off so that, because you owe us. And they, the, the colonists said, well, well, wait, we're British subjects. Aren't you supposed to defend us? And then they said, why are we getting taxes other people aren't getting? And then they couldn't really bargain against it because they didn't have any representation in Parliament. At that time, no other part um, of the UK today had representation in Parliament. So the British didn't, I mean, the British did, and they, it was an all British Parliament, but Scotland did not, Wales did not, Cornwall did not, um, Ireland did not. And so they they were owned technically um, by the, the British, but they did not have any representation either. And so the American Revolution essentially they said, "Will taxation without representation? Nope." And it, you don't have a right. So they at first they rebelled, and then what what the what England did is it, pretty much what they did in the other places. They replaced the nobility with their own people. So they kicked out all of the, the Scottish you know, no, nobles and they put in British people. Well, that's exactly what they did over here. They were like all the governors, all the, the main leaders of any given colony were replaced by British people, not colonists. And that then they cracked down even harder. They brought more military over. Essentially the, the Americans just said, no, we're done. And they declared, you know, the Declaration of Independence kind of started it all. And though it wasn't, you know, it was a bit one sided for a while, eventually the, the colonists won. And they finally, they, they finally got, oh, who was it who surrendered? I have to look it up. But finally, England surrendered and they left, their troops left. And then they had to, they spent several years create, first had a con, first Continental Congress. But the laws of confederation were not really helpful and they were pretty weak. And so the second Continental Congress is where they put together most of what is now the Constitution. And they developed a, a, essentially their, their, the, it was entirely meant to be much more democratic. So there were, there, from the beginning, we had no king. And we would never have a king. We probably would, I'm hoping we never have a king. And um, later on, of course, you know, the, 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 the French actually helped the Americans with the revolution and then that helped spark ideas. They brought it back and went, wait, we need to do something too. The French revolution, though, was a very different ball game. And we'll talk about that in, in, in a little. Um, as far as, you know, besides Voltaire's Candide, there is a lot of other literature and the vast majority of literature at this time was satire. So remember, reason is the whole name of the game. So we're not going to have really emotional, dramatic, melodramatic type of writing. It's all going to be very much tongue in cheek, making fun of people. And satire is just the name of the game. And probably the, the first Western novel, this is what seemed to be, the, and it's actually huge. It is so long. The original book was printed in 12 volumes, 12 volumes. And I have not been able to read it all the way through is just too dang long. It's longer than War and Peace, y'all. And, but it's, and it's a lot of repetitive stuff, but it's essentially this guy, this old man, Don Quixote, um, reads a bunch of, of medieval knightly courtly literature and falls in love with the idea and decides he's a knight 
and he's i think he's he's he either has dementia or alzheimer's or something like that but he just he decides he's going to go out and and make his fortune and go and save his lovely dulcinea that's her name the woman who whose colors he carries and you know he's she's his lady it turns out later on they do actually meet dulcinea and she's a milkmaid who's actually she has a different name but um that means nothing to don quixote he fights windmills at one point because he thinks they're giants swinging their arms around. Um, pretty much every fight he gets into, he loses badly and ends up beating up he and his his little friend Sancho Panza. And the, Don Quixote is still like the the one of the major figures. If you go to Spain, he is going to be in every shop. Little figures of Don Quixote because he's kind of like that the guy with the the imagination. Um, and wouldn't you rather go and live a fanciful life for, you know, fighting giants than live reality? And that's what he chooses to do. He essentially lives outside of reality. Then he come, finally is, draw, is brought back home to his daughter and he's completely out of his mind. And, and the end of the book actually ends with him um, being so old and, and crepid that he finally dies. And so it's, you know, it has a sad ending sort of, but it's not meant to be a sentimental tale. It is meant to make fun of our tendency to live in fantasy land instead of dealing with reality. That we, we'd rather read books and, and you know, live in a, a, a la-la land than face what's real. Um, the, the, probably the better of the, I mean, and it's certainly easier to read. It's shorter, it's a poem by Alexander Pope, and he's really called the father of the Enlightenment. He was much more of the age of reason than any other writer. And his Rape of the Lock is a, is a, is a it just mocks a, a very stupid incident between two fancy families. Literally the kid, one boy from one of the families, I mean, he's a young man, but he cuts a lock of hair off of a girl from the other family that he likes. And they go to war. They end up feuding for ever. And they, they, you know, they, they get each other arrested in the real world. They, the, the real families were awful. They, you know, one, one little incident and they just hate each other forever. Every, every family member on one side hates every family member on the other family. And so it's a real feud. Well, he makes it, writes a mock epic making fun of them and how stupid they are for, for getting all, you know, dithered up about a stupid you know, somebody getting her, her, a lock of her hair cut off. And so it's, it's just kind of, it makes it sound like it's this grand, horrible, you know, adventure. And really it's just silly. It's all, it, but it, it's meant to make fun of these people for being dumb. We, that, that's essentially the whole point is satire. All of the satire is to make fun of people for doing stupid, illogical things. Because remember, if we've got logic, then we're good. Um, but if we don't, if we we're, we're, we go stupid, then we're we're doomed, and that's kind of the point too of Jonathan Swift's books and his writings. He's if you've read anything by him, it's probably a modest proposal. You you might have read it in English class, uh, but it's he has a, he's essentially more than anything else. He's calling to to attention the plight of the poor in Ireland. He is an Irish writer, and. People were starving. A lot of children were starving and on the streets at this time. And he, his modest proposal is his solution to the problem. And it's horrifying. But it's horrifying because he's essentially saying we might as well fall into this because we're, we're almost there anyway. And we're, we, we care so little about the children who are, who are starving to death on the streets of Ireland. And so he, it's, it, most people take it and go, oh, that's horrifying. He's a bad man, but really he's, he's, it, it's satire. He's not saying what he, what the truth is. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You need to go read it. I don't want to break the, to, to, to burst his bubble, but it's intended as a, it looks like a straightforward essay. This is how we solve the problem of the poor in Ireland. And it comes out horrifying, but it's meant to horrify you so that you do something about it and help the poor people. Gulliver's Travels is far more interesting in some ways. I love The Modest Proposal, but Gulliver's Travels, I highly suggest at least reading books one, two, and four. There are four books total. Three is a little weird, um, but you've probably heard, if you've seen the movie or any movie about Gulliver's Travels, you probably only dealt with the very first book, and that's with the Lilliputians. Um, 
the Lilliputians are the tiny people. And I, here's the picture over on the side. This was an old illustration of Gulliver. And he was just normal size. He's actually a sailor, but he gets shipwrecked over and over and over again. Each book, it starts with him going, going out to sea as a sailor and being shipwrecked. And first he shipwrecked on this island that literally is filled with tiny little people who were about four or five inches tall. And he wakes up after being shipwrecked on the sand of the beach, but he's tied down by all these tiny little ropes and he's surrounded by these tiny people. And he thinks they're adorable, but they're actually really mean. And he, that's what he realizes is that they may be cute, like little dolls or something, but they're bad people. They're mean, mean people. They're, they're hateful, they're ignorant, they're, they, they make a war with Blefescu, the other, the neighboring little town of, of tiny people, because they, Blefescu eats their eggs the wrong way, literally. It's that stupid. But, you know, it's these petty differences that make them fight between each other. And they, they fight amongst themselves. They fight about everything. They, they're highly critical of Gull Gulliver. They think he's just ho horrible and frightening, but they also treat him with deference because they're afraid of him. And so there's, there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Then the second, you know, eventually he gets picked up by a boat and he sails away. Then Brobdingnag is the second. And in this one, he's the little five inch person and Brobdingnagians are gigantic. So the next island, it's all fantasy, of course, but the next island is filled with these huge people and they think he's adorable and he thinks they're gross because he can see every wart, every wrinkle, every little pimple, you know, he's just like, oh, these people are vile and you can't convince him of anything else until once he's gone and he's gotten off the island, he realizes they were actually really nice people and he totally judged them. So he was the petty person. He was the Lilliputian when he got to Brogdenag. Laputa is really much more about an a floating island and and he gets onto the float he's actually pulled on up onto the floating island and it's all scientists and philosophers and a bunch of people who are so busy studying humankind that they just don't have any compassion for humankind anymore and they you know anything bad that happens below them they are above and so they just don't care they have no no common decency anymore and they're all juxtapositioning each other they're all trying to outdo each other and sound more world worldly or more scientific or more intelligent and they've just kind of lost contact with the real world which is a criticism of his scientific community all these philosophs i guess and then finally then my favorite book is book four and i've actually taught it all by itself in world literature but um, it's and it, he he lands on a, an island of Winhams and they you know they think wow how do they spell that well um, Winhams are are horses but they they call themselves Winhams because that's how they talk Winhams and then they're they're the other species on the island is the Yahoo and you, I know you've heard of a Yahoo you've probably checked out Yahoo.com before that's where it comes from and yahoos are human-like beings but they're covered with hair and they're mean and, and creepy and they're awful they're like the vilest of vile human beings and gulliver is absolutely appalled by them well the winhams think at first they keep calling him a yahoo they're like yahoo yahoo and eventually he learns their language and realizes that they think he's like a super splendid version of these little hairy you know, mean men who are running around throwing, you know, poop at each other. They really do. They, they, they have violence toward each other. They, they have war all the time. They, they throw excrement at each other. They rape each other. They're just horrible, vile. It's like if, be, be, if humans were absolute beasts, that's what the yahoos were. Well, the Winhams, I mean, Gulliver loves the Winhams because the Winhams are all ruled by reason. They do only things for reasonable reasons. There's no emotion in anything. Um, but they're afraid that Gulliver, being the splendid man he is, is that, that he's going to become king of the Yahoos and he's going to overthrow the Winhams. So they forcibly put him in a boat and, and, and put him back out to sea. And he is so de devastated that when he gets home back to his wife and kids, his long-suffering wife and kids, he can't bear the sight of them. He can't, he can't eat at the table with them. He can't talk to them. He, they're just a bunch of yahoos. And so the end of the book is rather like Jonathan Swift. He, can, he admits he is kind of a misanthrope, which is a person who just doesn't get on well with people, doesn't like people. And Gulliver becomes the same thing. In fact, he spends the last scenes in the book are him talking to the horses in his stable 
because he's he really wants to go back and be a Wynnum again, you know, to go back to the Wynnum's island. So it's it's rather a sad ending, but that's typical in this. I mean, they, they it's again we're we're mocking society. We're trying to point out the fo foibles, and so even if we are doing that, Jonathan Swift is in some ways poking fun at himself. Because if he's Gulliver and he doesn't like people, well, he's a person too. And he has to remember that he's actually a human being and he's as fallible as other people are. He's not above others. So it's 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 a really fascinating book. It's very entertaining. The Yahoos and Winnems are super entertaining. It's I, I would I need to reread that book. I haven't read it in a while. So um, I, I strongly urge that one. Other good books. Robinson Crusoe is a great book. A great book. It is so good. Um, very, very entertaining. Maul Flanders is a great book, but it's Robinson Crusoe is a man who ends up on a desert island and he has to make do. And so he builds his own little house. You know, he kind of like um, Swiss Family Robinson, only he's all by himself. Then he, he saves a guy from being eaten by cannibals who he was captured and but he, they were about to eat him. They were about to cook, cook him and eat him. And he saves him, names him Friday. And he and Friday have great adventures. And then Maul Flanders is about a woman who ends up, she's, she's a maid in someone's house and she, the master's son essentially finds her beautiful and does things with her he shouldn't do. And then she eventually will become a prostitute, but she is always a nice person. She just doesn't care so much about society's rules, but eventually she ends up happy at the end. Um, mainly because she's still a nice person, even if she's making choices society wouldn't make. So it's kind of a commentary on the rules we make, especially for women, and the, 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 the way that we condemn women for things that they are, are not their fault, that they had no, that they tried not to have happen. Um, for some reason, and this is really, it, it is, it's going to be a theme all the way through until today. There's a, a lot of books at this time that deal with women who are being essentially raped or attacked or, um, you know, the, the sexual harassment type stuff, you know, where the, the guys are going after them and they're trying to fight them off. Pamela is all about that. It's actually written in letters. It's an epistolary novel. So it's written in epistles or letters. And the, she becomes a servant and at this noble household and she's all happy. She's writing back and forth to her parents. But then the son of the servant, the son of the master wants to sleep with her. And he's constantly like, catching her in bedrooms and chasing her around things. And, and she's always trying to get away. Eventually, by the end of the book, they get married. He proposes to her, they get married, but it's not happily ever after. Why? Because he's a creep. And so the second book that comes after Pamela, he's already sleeping around with the maids and he's, he's, he's having mistresses and Pamela realizes she made a huge mistake. I mean, it's, but again, it's this idea that men will be men and women have to be careful you know, because men are never going to change. Um, Henry Fielding, who wrote, he's best known for Tom Jones, and there's a really good movie of that name. It's, it's very body. Um, but Tom Jones is, is, a, is a goofy character who sleeps with several women, and it's, it's, it's fun, but again, it's making fun of the foibles of society. But he wrote a parody of Pamela called Shamala. So this may be the very first parody ever written of another novel. Um, and it's just, it makes fun of the whole thing. It, it, and I'm sure Samuel Richardson was not appreciative of Henry Fielding making fun. But Tom Jones is delightful. It's long, um, but it is delightful. Pamela is a weird book, I have to say. I laughed. Some of the novel, some of the letters to her parents had to have been, you know, 18 pages long. So um, she wrote some very, very long. And the fact that parents are all like, just be careful. You know, she'd tell them about being chased around and almost cornered in a, in a closet, you know, and raped. And they'd be like, well, just be careful. And it was just no parent would 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 say that. Um, so, but it's all silly, but it's meant to be silly. So there's a lot of humor, but it's all satirical humor. So a lot of it's going to be very, um, you know, it's, a, it's biting. It's a little harsh at times. And it certainly makes fun of everyone. Before I go to the architecture, though, I'm going to go... I'm going to skip to a particular kind, this particular painter, and then we'll go back to art and architecture. Um, Hogarth was a painter. He was probably the best known satirist painter in the Enlightenment. And his stuff, first he'd make a painting like this one below, 
And then, but the, the vast majority of what he made money off of was printings of these. They were like cartoons. Only they, they, they told, a, there was a series of them, of these different pictures, and they told a story. But the stories were all satirical. And honestly, they all ended badly, they all ended badly. And yet they were meant to show society its foibles. You know, what were they doing stupid that they needed to change? So they were all lessons. And that's the, really all of these are. These are lessons, you know, trying to teach society not to be as stupid as it is. Uh, so he, if you want to look, I, I listed out four of them and it, by far, the Rake's Progress, Marriage a la Mode, and A Harlot's Progress are the easiest to find. But you can actually look them up on Google and see the whole series of them. Boop, 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 boop. You know, here are the five that, that you know, make up one series and tell the whole story. But he made a, a painting and then he created a print based on the painting and then printed it. And those prints were sold. So you could buy them for a penny or something like that. And tons of people bought them. They were extremely popular. And this was probably, this might have been the beginning of really putting comics and those kinds of, you know, political cartoons inside newspapers because people, the, people had a definite appetite for seeing something pithy and funny in a very small frame, you know, just somebody drawing something. And so the, with the Rake's Progress, it was a young man who comes on to money and spends it, gambles, does stupid things with it and ends up destitute. Um, the marriage a la mode to women get to, I mean, a man and a woman are essentially assigned marriage. You know, they, they, they have an arranged marriage. So they're, in fact, the first painting is the two dads signing the documents to marry them. And the two people are sitting next to each other, but they're not even looking at each other. Like they don't, they, they really haven't met. They don't have any connection to each other. And then by the end of the series of paintings, they're, they're both miserable and unhappy because they've both cheated on each other and they've partied and they've done all sorts of mean things to each other because they weren't in love. They had no, I mean, it was just an arranged marriage. And then the harlot's progress is actually a woman who comes into town as a maid. She wants to find work as a maid and she instead is picked up by a pimp and then becomes a, 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 a prostitute. And the last scene is her being dead. And it's really awful. So it's, I mean, but it's meant, you know, it, it really was meant to be humorous, which is, you know, by our standards is like, wow, that's, that's harsh, but that's what it, it was also meant to show how we were doing stupid things. And so that's, that was just the, you know, and, and, and Hogarth, I mean, I would, I would strongly suggest, you know, besides what you see in the, in the chapter, look him up because his stories are very weird, but they follow that satirical bent. The vast majority, though, of, of, of architecture and art is not going to necessarily be satirical. The first half of it, of architecture is, is, and, and art, are both kind of, they're called Rococo. And they're, if you remember back to the, the Baroque period, remember, everything was super emotional and then really florid, right? You know, all this fluffy stuff and foo-foo this and extra crown molding and all that. Well... Rococo is like all of that without the emotion. So it's just fanciful and frilly and not serious. It's all playful. And if you saw the, the live action Beauty and the Beast movie, her room looks a lot like the room that you will see over on the left hand side. Why? Because it was patterned after that very same room. This is a one of the most famous Rococo designs still kept in really fantastic um, still really in really good shape but it used gold paint instead of gold leafing is actually more likely the, the rococo became less about the materials used and more about how foofy could you go you know and so it went super foofy um, all of this is gold painted not gold leafed but gold painted and i think in the beauty and the beast thing it actually like some of the gold stuff comes off and comes down and floats onto her dress, you know, so, but this is an actual interior of, of a room in France. And then this, the one on the right is a church. And when it was first built, a lot of people criticized it. They were just like, how can you sit in a church when it's, it looks like it's a frosted wedding cake? And 
because and all of the the moldings everything that's there and it's all painted lavishly and everything well it's it's all made of plaster and even the the interiors let me let me blow this up a bit just so you can see it better uh, the interior um designs even you know it looks like there's this really wonky mold, um marble in the 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 pillars but they're not made of marble that's faux that's the first time they really use that faux painting to pretend to be marble without actually having to use marble so it's it's actually cheaper to make and it's kind of like you know you can buy a statue today and you can get it for i don't know you could get a mail order and it's all made of resin so it's all this plasticky stuff out of a mold well that's what they use they did much more of this kind of you know plaster shaping of stuff than actually carving anything so but it looks so flamboyant it's just but that's rococo and yet it's not serious it definitely lacks the seriousness and the emotional impact it's just about looking pretty and the paintings actually got that way too so rococo art was all about pastorals really leafy settings lots of you know pinks and and pale greens everything was was you know they have the like in this one they have the little this is the embarkation for Cythera, and they're actually, they've got cupids flying around, little fairies flying around all around the people who are kind of picnicking. Um, it's also, it tends to be, um, it, it, it often tends to be a lot naughtier, and that's not this particular painting, but Jean-Honoré Fragonard is well, very well remembered for this. Um, his bathers, he has a lot of um, Greek mythology that he uses, all in this kind of pastoral, lush landscape, lots of nude bodies, which was not typical. Um, it's not a religious painting, obviously, at all. It was meant to really be a fun painting. It's almost like, you know, Playboy on a painting, you know, but that was intent. It's intent. It was supposed to be very nudie and very playful and very naughty, and that's really okay. The other thing that they have, and it's, it's a, I'm going to show you, I, I, I'm going to pull out the link. Yeah, there we go. Hopefully you can see that. But this is Fragonard's The Swing. And it's definitely his most famous painting. It took a tremendous amount. It's actually a very large painting. It's, it's, it, it'll fill a wall pretty beautifully. But um, there are several details about this. First of all, of course, it's pastoral. There's a Cupid statue, not a Cupid, but a statue. And then, of course, the main focus is this woman in pink, all floofy, you know, with lots of ruffles and everything. And she's swinging in the center of the painting. Well, in front of her, though, you see there's this man and he's reaching for her. And he's also looking right up her skirt. But he's not the one who's swinging her. So there's a man who actually is her date, if you want to think about it that way. And he is over, he's right over here. And you can, he actually has a rope that's tied to the swing itself so that he can swing her really high. But at the same time, hidden in the bushes is another dude, and she knows he's there. She's looking at him and she's raising her foot in a kick so that he can look down her, up her dress. And she's even kicking a shoe out to him. So it's a very naughty painting. And yet it is absolutely, um, it's absolutely part of, of what we are dealing with. This is Rococo. So we're gonna have lots of details, super, look at all the leaves. He actually painted them all individually. And yet they are, the the actual subject matter is a bit naughty so um besides that you know if, if once we get out of the rococo era i should say we get to much more um serious stuff and this is when we're going to really move into what was called the neoclassical period so we're going to have um, genre painting is probably the most important paintings that happen after the rococo stuff it's they're not delightful they're not filled with fluffiness they're they're far more serious and mostly they're meant to show real life. So they, they, it's almost like you're showing paintings of a real area with real people in a real situation. So there's much more the the subject matter is not super fancy, you know, the very rich people with the floofy dresses. It's ordinary people, people sitting on a carriage, 
together and all cramped and and you know shoved in there because they're 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 they don't own their own carriage or later on it's you know this the genre painting will continue and it's people sitting on a train and they're the the poor people who are riding a train wherever they're going and they have you know some bread and cheese that they're eating and that's their humble fare for the day but it's it's meant to show just regular people living regular lives in as realistic a way as possible it's probably closer to um jan um ben ben oh, what's his name i can't even remember the guy's name i'm really horrible with names you guys um ben Mir, yeah the the guy who who did the girl with one pearl earring um, cause she, cause he was trying to be very realistic with lighting, with colors, with clothing and that's, and so that this is really where still life start to come back in to, to favor. They still are. I know artists today who paint still lifes, but it's much more about painting real people who are really there and who are really in real situations. Architecture also moved to the rational, you know, and, and actually that's, the, to them, the rational was the neoclassical. So they went back to ancient Greece and Rome, looked at, okay, how do we make, you know, that, you know, that time period come back? And in fact, if you go to Washington, D.C. today, the vast majority of the buildings in Washington, D.C. are neoclassical. The only exception is the, the Library of Congress, because inside the Library of Congress, it is absolutely Baroque. But be, beyond that, it has little, you know, fluffy things all over the place, weird crown molding and little, even, even has like little flying cherubs, literally painted on the walls. But most of the buildings in Washington, D.C., from the Jefferson Memorial to the, um, to the Washington, well, the Washington Monument is absolutely, it's, it's an obelisk from, um, it's really Egyptian, but, um, even the Capitol building, the White House, all of these buildings are neoclassical. There are other ones you can find too. There are quite a few. Um, Georgetown University is is neoclassical in the neoclassical style. Barry College is uh, north of us is actually in the neo-Gothic style. Um, but if you go to the University of Virginia, that was built in neoclassical style. It was actually designed by Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson. And you can see the Rotunda building, which is one of their more historic buildings the rotunda is on the far right on this slide then his his home jefferson's home Mon monticello um is on the far left hand side and you can see the resemblance between those two buildings well he designed both there is a central dome in monticello and he actually designed a clock if you go into the entrance which is in that where that dome is it's it actually goes all the way to the ceiling it's a very tall front room and there's a clock that is a wind clock. You know, you actually has a, a, be, a pull to it. That's a chain that rewinds it and you have to pull it once a day, but he designed it for that front room so that he could always have a clock that told time. Um, but he was, a, he was an architect as well as a bunch of other things. Um, and he designed mo many of the older buildings on the University of Virginia campus, which is still beautiful, but they also, as they built new buildings added to that, it's still in the neoclassical style. So they were trying to do the same thing. But again, you can, if you can't see the, the resemblance, you should. Um, the, the big difference was like, for instance, in the United States, and this is at Georgetown as well, not really so much in Washington, DC, but definitely in Georgetown and the University of Virginia. And you can see it in Monticello as, Monticello as, as well. Um, we had what we called the Federalist style. And that's the style that, of when the United States began, the buildings that were built around that time were neoclassical. Early neoclassical in the United States especially was um, like, you could see a lot of buildings in Philadelphia are like this. Those were buildings that were almost all made of brick because those were the local materials. Later buildings, most of which were built in places like Washington DC were made of marble. So they were really following much more strictly the neoclassical style. So they're really, their buildings are ne purely neoclassical, but the buildings like of Monticello um, and at the University of Virginia, those are federalist because they are brick, 
but they use a lot of the same elements that are part of the classical styles, Roman and Greek. But they are at, I mean, actually I had a home in Bainbridge, um, Georgia, and it was a Federalist style. It actually was, it was, well, it was Georgian. And that's just, it had the red brick and then it had white pillars in front and had a little porch and had, you know, the, like you can see over on the University of Virginia side, they're using Corinthian style on the pillars. And it looks a lot like the Pantheon in case you didn't notice. So if Pantheon has a, has a bigger porch and it has more pillars. So it has several rows of pillars that, that's, that pull out from the main dome. But, um, but yeah, the, the Pantheon is now at the University of Virginia. It's smaller. This is actually a much smaller building than the University of Virginia, but so. Um, as far as classical music, this is where we really get real classical music. So remember with, with the Baroque, it was Bach primarily. Um, now we have probably one of the most famous musicians in, in, in Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. A really good movie, I still like it, is Amadeus. And it has a lot about his life. It's not totally accurate, but it's 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 close enough. It, it, he did die very young, um, and he what he did get really sick, and they think it was mostly alcohol related. So we don't really know how he you know exactly what happened because they didn't have quite the the medicine that we do today. But he was put in a graveyard, um, a mass grave, because he had no money. He he died very much broke, mainly because he spent his money. Um, he was a, he was a bit flighty, but he wrote 41 symphonies, which is a lot. He was extremely prolific. He wrote his first symphony at the age of eight. His sister played. Um, she played the violin and the piano. Often she and her and her brother um, Wolfgang would play together. They would he would play the violin and she would play the piano. She did write music too, but we don't have any of her any samples of her writing because her father did not believe women should compose music. So there's also a really good movie about that. It's called Mozart's Sister. And it's, I think it was originally in German, but it has either, I think they did voiceover when I saw it. Um, so it's, but it's, it's very much worth watching. It's sad, but it's because it's just that the limitations placed on women were so different. Um, Franz Joseph Haydn is, they, a lot of people call him Papa Haydn because they see him as the father of modern classical music and ancient classical music. But um, he, he, he played the surprise symphony, which was really fun. Uh, he, he got, he would, he knew people tended to fall asleep in symphonies. And so even then they do today as well, but he thought that was funny. So he, he kind of lulled people into a sense of, oh, it's just gonna be a nice, you know, solitary, whatever, boring symphony. And then he shocked him right in the middle of it. And um, so he played around with that. He, 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 had a, he had a good sense of humor. He was also, he also had a lot of children. And so um, that's another reason why he was called Papa Haydn. But many of the, the essentially what happened is it, in the Baroque era, when symphonies first began, they were really pretty small. So even the one under probably Louis the 14th had the biggest one. And his, he might've had like 50, 60 members at any given time. Today's symphonies usually have much large, are much larger. Some of them have over a hundred members. Um, sometimes they bring in a lot more other members. There are times when they put two symphonies together to really increase the sound. Although most stages can't accommodate that many, but symphonies were getting bigger. Plus operas were getting far more developed. Um, Mozart wrote a lot of operas. Haydn did not, but, um, but a lot more operas were, are going to come in the romantic era too. Verdi is going to be a romantic era um, opera right? He's my favorite of all of the opera writers. But the truth is that there's a lot of possibilities here and they're just getting, they're expanding. The sonnet form, sonata form becomes bigger. The, the symphony form becomes more regularized. Plus the, the, there, are more, um, there are more instruments. So we have a, had a few woodwinds. Now we have many different kinds of woodwinds. Brass instruments are really being um, developed as well. And those that will continue all the way to like the sousaphone and things like that, which will be, you know, it's not invented for a while yet to come. But um, there's much more. This is the truth is, is we talk about classical music like it's all snooty, but the, 
this was popular music at the time, but we didn't have a radio. So the only way to do music is to, you know, we'd have people who compose it and especially compose piano pieces and pieces for violin. And then common people would learn to play the violin or learn to play the piano. And so um, that was one of those standard things that women learned how to do. They learned with the harp, or the piano or the violin or something. Um, so that they could create music at home. And so now with the printing press, remember this has been established, <clears throat> you could print music and sheet music would be, could be bought. You still today, you can buy sheet music. I have tons of sheet music because I have a piano. Um, but but people would learn to, they, they'd get tutors or, and they'd learn to play their own music and learn their instruments and play music at home. But so this was really that this is like it's like opera was the movies to go to and plays were the movies to go to they didn't have movies they didn't have the radio so this was music this was it, it's not it's by our standards it's classical and yet by their standards it's modern it's like elvis presley or something you know or the b-52s or um i don't know megadeth <laughs> I like to make a death. Anyway, um, that's it for this period. Now, th so this was the Age of Enlightenment. The next chapter, though, the last chapter for the class is the, the Romantic era. And Romanticism is going to go in the opposite direction. Hopefully, I clued you in that that was kind of thing was going to happen anyway. So remember, we went Baroque, which is all about emotion and florid stuff. Then we get to hear the Age of Enlightenment when everything is reason, 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 and we go neoclassical. And then we move on to the Romantics where everything is not about reason. It's about emotion and imagination. And we'll see where we go when we get there. If you have questions, be sure to send me a course mail and I will talk to you guys later. See ya.